Well, we are continuing our study. We're almost finished with this part of the series. We've been talking about praise and worship. And we're covering different ways that we can praise and worship the Lord. Just, we'll just do just a quick review for those of you who haven't been here. What is the first reason that we covered that you should praise the Lord? First thing we covered was found in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 6. We found where King David's wife, Michael, she looked down and she saw King David leaping and dancing and praising the Lord with all of his heart. He was just dancing before the Lord with every fiber of his being. He was giving the Lord all he had. He was worshiping Him in total abandonment, not holding anything back. He was just loving his Lord. And Michael, his wife, looked out the window and saw him, and the Scripture says she despised him in her heart. And what happened to her because she judged the King David for his love for the Lord and for his praise and for his worship unto the Lord? What happened to her? 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 23 says, Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. She was barren in the natural because she judged King David because he was praising and worshiping the Lord. And I don't want to be barren spiritually. That's the number one reason that we should praise and worship the Lord is so we won't be barren spiritually. And if we judge those who love the Lord and who will praise Him and worship Him and honor Him, if we judge them, if we criticize them, if we put them down, it's going to bring barrenness in our soul. And I don't want to be barren spiritually to you. I want to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in operation in my life. The fruit of the Spirit of Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith. All of the gifts, all of the fruits of the Spirit that's listed there in Galatians 5. I don't want to be barren spiritually. I want to walk in, in all of the fruits that the Holy Spirit has for me in my Christian walk, don't you? And that is one the first reason that we covered why you should praise and worship the Lord is so you will not be barren spiritually. The second reason that we talked about the reason that you should praise the Lord is that when you're in a battle, when you're in a spiritual battle, when you're in a natural battle, a physical battle, it may be a battle of health, whatever fiery trial, whatever battle you're going through, when you are in a battle, God will deliver you if you will shout unto Him and if you will praise Him and worship Him. We covered it in the chapter of Second Chronicles chapter 13. How King Abijah and the army of the southern kingdom of Judah, they were outnumbered two to one by King Jeroboam and the army of the northern kingdom of Israel. And King Abijah and the army of Judah, they were completely surrounded. And it didn't look like in the natural that there was any hope for them to win that battle. And what did they do? They cried unto the Lord and the priests blew the trumpets in Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 14. Then what happened? In verse 15 it says, Then the men of Judah gave a shout. And as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. They cried unto the Lord, they sounded the alarm with the trumpet, and then they gave a shout unto the Lord. And the Scripture says God smote. God smote their enemies. They didn't have to fight in the battle. God intervened and God came running to their rescue when they sounded the alarm and when they gave a shout. And it's the same way with you and I today. When we're in a battle, when we are in the fiery trial and when it's hot and when we don't know which way to go and where to turn, we are to cry out unto the Lord, sound the alarm, and then give a shout. Begin to praise Him. Begin to worship Him. And when we give a shout, He will come running to our rescue just like He did in 
the Old Testament when his children would cry out unto him and when they would begin to shout unto him and praise him. And then the third reason that we covered why you should praise the Lord is that when you praise the Lord, the walls that the enemy has built in your life will fall down. You remember the scripture we covered for that? It's in the book of Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. The children of Israel had come to the city of Jericho. And the, there was a huge wall built around the city of Jericho. And scholars tell us that the wall was so wide and so thick that they held chariot braces on the top of this wall. This was a big wall, wasn't it? Wide, thick wall. And it didn't look like there was any way that the children of Israel could, could defeat the city of Jericho. And the army of the children of Israel had besieged the city. They had completely surrounded the city of Jericho. And in this huge, large, fortified city that they thought in the natural was impossible for any army to come in and take them. But what happened? In verse 5 of Joshua chapter 6, the Word of God says, And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall do what? Shout with a great shout. And what did God say would happen? And the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. God gave them instructions. He told them, number one, sound the alarm, blow the trumpet, and then they were to what? Shout with a great shout. So the people obeyed the command of the Lord. They sounded the alarm, and then they shouted with a great shout. And God caused the walls of that city, that those huge walls that surrounded that fortified city, God caused those walls to fall Amen. down Amen. flat. Amen. The people obeyed. And God, he, oh, he honored His Word. And he did what He said He would do. And the walls that fell down flat. The people did. They did. God did. And it did. Yes. Hallelujah. The walls <coughs> fell down when the people obeyed and when God honored His Word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the, then the, the fourth reason that we covered last week, the reason that you should praise and worship the Lord is that praise steals the enemy. And you remember the scripture that we covered? Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent or how majestic is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Verse 2 of Psalms chapter 8. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. And God said, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, infants and toddlers, thou hast ordained strength. And what's that word strength in the Hebrew? Praise. Praise. Yes. That thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. That word steal, do you remember what it means? It means to cause, to make, cease. In other words, it stops the enemy in his tracks. Hallelujah. Who's going to be stopped? The enemy and the avenger, the Word of God says. And who's that? The devil. And in the New International Version of verse 2, it says, From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When we praise the Lord, when we worship the Lord, uninhibited, unhindered, and in total abandonment, the enemy is stopped dead in his tracks because praise steals the enemy and he can go no further. Glory to God. If that was the only reason that we should praise the Lord, we should praise Him non-stop for the longest day that we live, shouldn't we? Praise is our number one weapon to use against the enemy, along with putting your armor on that Ephesians 6 talks about. Putting on 
your the, the shoes of the salvation of the, the gospel, having your loins girt about with truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God and your shield of faith. Before you put on that armor, put your praise on first because praise will steal the enemy and the avenger. Glory to God. And we talked about the fifth reason why you should praise and worship the Lord is that when you praise and worship the Lord, He will fight your battles for you. Hey! Woo! What kind of a deal is that? All we have to do is praise Him and worship Him and He will fight for us. We're no match for the enemy. We can't win against Him, but we don't have to. Hallelujah! He will fight for us. He did it in the Old Testament and we have a new covenant based on better promises than they had in the Old Covenant. Hallelujah! We covered the scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 how an enemy army had come against King Jehoshaphat and the army of the children of Israel. And King Jehoshaphat prayed and in verse 12 of 2 Chronicles chapter 20 he prayed and he said, Oh our God! Wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And when we're in the battle, when we have a problem that is so big that we can't see around it, we can't see over it, it doesn't look like there is it there any way around it. It seems insurmountable. All we have to do is be like King Jehoshaphat and say, God, I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. I'm looking to you to bring me through this, to give me the victory over this. And the king said, God, we don't know what to do. But Lord, we are looking to you. Our eyes are on you. We're depending on you. We are trusting in you to, de to deliver us and to help us. And God answered the king's prayer in verse 15. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God. And as He has answered to you, whatever battle you're facing, whatever problems you're going through, the answer from God to you is, be not afraid nor dismayed. For the battle is not yours, but mine, God says. And He told them in verse 17, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. They hadn't seen a thing happen yet, but just on God's Word, saying, you won't have to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Stand you still and see the salvation of the Lord. They went on God's Word and they said, I know that God is with us and I know that He will see us through. And they bowed their head and they fell on their face before the Lord and they worshipped the Lord. And in verse 21, the Scripture says, And when he had consulted with the people, King Jehoshaphat, he appointed singers unto the Lord and that should praise the beauty of holiness. Oh, don't you like that? That's a title of God. He is the beauty of yes. holiness. King Jehoshaphat appointed singers that they would praise the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. And the singers went out before the army to say, Praise the Lord for His mercy endureth forever. King Jehoshaphat sent the choir out.
out in front of the army. And when the choir began to sing, and when they began to lift up their voice in praise and in worship to the Lord, in verse 22, it, it tells us that God Himself sent ambushments. And in verses 23 and 24, the enemy army got so confused that they turned on each other and they started killing one another. And the children of Israel did not even have to lift their sword. All they did was praise the Lord and worship the Lord. And God worked a miracle for them that day. And when you praise Him, when you worship Him, the Lord Himself will fight your battles for you. He will work a miracle in your behalf and He will give you the victory over the enemy. Hallelujah! Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't you glad He's on our side? Amen. What foe can defeat us? What enemy can come against us? None. None can win against us because the Lord of host is on our side. Glory to God. And now the sixth reason that you should praise and worship the Lord. You're going to like this one. It's when you praise and worship the Lord, you will be set free from the areas that the enemy has held you captive or held you bound. One more time. When you praise and worship the Lord, you will be set free from the areas that the enemy has held you captive and held you in bondage. Turn to the book of Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Oh, this is one of my favorite passages. You say, you always say that. I know my favorite passage is the one I'm teaching on that moment. <laughs> But this is one of my absolute most favorite passages. Acts chapter 16. Paul was preaching in the city of Philippi. And he and some men, he, there were some men accompanying Paul. And we know that one of these men was Luke. Luke wrote the book of Acts. And we know that at this time, that this instance that we're going to read about took place, we know that Luke was traveling with Paul. How do we know this? Look at Acts chapter 16, verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer. Luke is writing. He wrote the book of Acts. And Luke writes, and, it's, and he says, And it came to pass as we went to prayer. So Luke was one of the men that was traveling or accompanying Paul here in the city, in the city of Philippi. And it came to pass as we went to prayer. A certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination. Divination. And that word in the Greek is Python, a spirit of divination or python, an evil spirit. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which wrought her masters much gain by soothsaying or fortune telling. Verse 17, the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which shew unto us the way of salvation. Now, how did, this, how did this evil spirit, speaking through this woman, how did this evil spirit know who Paul and these men were? Why? How did they know that? They were spirits. They were involved and they operated in the realm of the spirit, the spirit world. That's why this was an evil spirit. Any spirit that does not give credit to God is an, of the other world, of the underworld, the, the wrong spirit, the spirit of the enemy. And you need to flee, you need to run from, you need to stay away, away from any spirit that is not of the Lord. Anybody that goes to fortune tellers or, or mind readers, tarot cards, any of that is of the occult realm. And you need to run from it because the, the evil spirits, if you get start, if you step over in their realm, you are opening the door for the enemy to come in and attack you. The, the evil spirits, they know people that are Christians. They knew Jesus. 
When Jesus would encounter an evil spirit, he wouldn't have to make it be quiet because they would, the evil spirit would begin to scream and cry out and say, are you, are you come to torment us before our time? We know who you are. You're the Son of God. And Jesus would have to tell them to be quiet and he wouldn't allow them to speak. And you remember the seven sons of Sceva? They were trying to cast out evil spirits in the name of Jesus that Paul preached. You remember? That if you are to get out in the realm of the spirit, you're going to encounter the spirit world. And you, unless you are praying to the Lord, the Holy Spirit is the only spirit you want to be in contact Amen. with. And those seven, those seven sons of Sceva, they were trying to cast an evil spirit out of this man. And the evil spirit, they, they said, we we adjure you in the name of Jesus Christ yes. whom Paul preached. And that evil spirit spoke up in that man and said, Jesus I know, yep. and Paul I know, but who are you? And that evil spirit jumped on these seven full grown men and just beat them up, just whooped up on them, tore their clothes off of them, and these seven sons of Sheba, they ran from that place, wounded and naked. I tell you, you don't want to mess around in the occult realm. You don't want to mess around with anything that is not of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is the only one that we are to, to be in contact with. And we are to pray and seek advice. If you want to know something, you pray and ask the Lord. Don't go to a fortune teller or get involved in the mediums or any other of the occult realm. Because that is not of God. You're, you're opening the door. You're stepping over into Satan's territory. And so this this woman, she had a spirit of divination, a python spirit, an evil spirit. And that spirit knew who Paul was. And now let's, let's pick that up again. Verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination or a spirit of python met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying or fortune telling. The same followed Paul and us crying. This evil spirit speaking through this woman said, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which shew unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, Now was he talking to the woman? The woman that followed him for days and days and days? And this evil spirit would speak through the woman and and it would tell everybody around, we know who this is. This is Paul. And these men have come to show us the way of salvation. And Paul finally had enough of it. He was being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he, he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they couldn't make any more money off of this fortune teller. People who wanted to come and get their fortune told and, and wanted to know what's going to happen to them in the future. I mean, up until this time, the, the woman had been in contact with the, the evil spirit realm and she would be able to tell people's fortunes. And that the, the, her masters charged money for her to do that. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them or dragged them into the marketplace and to the rulers. If you look this up in the Greek, it means that they dragged them probably by their feet. So they, here they are dragging the men of God by their feet or across the, their stony ground. It was ripping their flesh, ripping their clothes off. And they drew them into the marketplace under the rulers, verse 20, and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them or threw them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. 
So not only had they been drugged that through town by their ankles, and not only had they been beaten and had many stripes laid upon them, but now they here they are thrown into the inner prison. Verse 24. And the jailer, it says, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner pre prison and made their feet fast in the stock. So here they have been drugged through town by their, by their heels, and then they've been beaten, and now not only are they thrown in prison, but they're thrown in the inner prison, and now they, their feet are locked in stocks. Now they're chained up on top of everything else. Does this look like in the natural a time to be happy? Does this look like a time to rejoice? It looks like there's no hope for them, doesn't it? It looks like they are totally chained up, that they are totally in bondage. And so many Christians today are in bondage. We're not in literal chains of bondage, but so many Christians are bound in certain areas of their lives. It may be an obsession with making money. It may be a pornography. It may be anything in your mind. Or it may be a bondage. It may be being gripped with fear, worry, anxiety. That is bondage. If you, if you don't know, if you've never been just gripped with fear, if you've never had an anxiety attack or panic attack, it's bondage in the alley. Christians, so many today have areas of bondage in their life. And if you and I would tell the truth, we've got areas of bondage in our, in our life. Areas that the enemy holds us captive. And we long to be free from those areas of bondage, but we don't know how to break free. We don't know how to break free from the chains that have us bound. Look at verse 25. And at midnight. I don't know about you, but I've been through some midnight hours. Have you? Yes. How many of you are going through a midnight hour right now in your life? And at midnight. The darkest part of the night. And at midnight, Paul and Silas did something. What did they do? Prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Now looking at their circumstances, this did not seem like the time to be praising God, did it? Their bodies were racked with pain. They could have been murmuring and complaining. Silas could have shouted out to Paul, Paul, look what you've got us into this time by preaching the gospel. Paul, look what you've done. If you just left that woman alone that had that evil spirit, if you hadn't cast that evil spirit out of that woman, we wouldn't be in this mess that we're in tonight. Paul and Silas, and Silas could have been murmuring. They could have been complaining. But instead, they was praying and singing praises to God. And notice that it says, All the prisoners heard them. The prisoners got in on it too. They're in the depth of the darkest hour of midnight. The prisoners heard Paul and Silas praying and singing praises to God. So they couldn't have been doing it quietly, could they? They couldn't have been praying and praising the Lord silently, could they? All of the prisoners heard them. And notice what time it was? Midnight. Midnight hours come in each of our lives, don't they? Yeah. You experience the loss of a loved one. You experience problems. You experience trials. You experience tests. You, you experience persecutions. And this verse gives you the key that will bring deliverance from that midnight hour in your life. And if you're not in a midnight hour now, take notes because one will come your way. You don't have to pray for one. You don't have to seek one. The enemy will make sure that a midnight hour comes your way. This verse gives you the key that will bring the elements from that midnight hour. Either the midnight hour you're in right now or the midnight hour that's coming. The key to bring deliverance from that midnight hour is prayer and praise. Yeah. Pray to the Father and then praise Him and thank Him for the answer. Yes, even though you don't see any change at the moment, even though it's still dark in those circumstances, 
even though you don't see one ray of hope, one ray of light, one breaking of the dawn, you don't see any of that. You pray, and then you begin to praise and worship the Lord. And you continue to praise Him. And deliverance will come. Watch what happened. Verse 26. And suddenly, I like God's suddenly, don't you? <laughs> Remember another suddenly in the book of Acts chapter 2? The 120, they were all gathered in the upper room. They were, were in one mind and in one accord. And what happened? Suddenly, there came a sound of a rushing mind. Oh, it's a great study sometimes. If you'll go through the Word of God and, and look and study about the suddenlies of God in the Scripture. Well, this is a suddenly. I like God's suddenlies. It seems like there's no hope. It seems like there's no way out. It seems like you're going to for the last time. But suddenly, God's not ever early and He's never late. He's always right on time. And to us, He's always last minute. We want it last week, last month. We want to be out of the trial. We want to be out of the midnight hour. But God always shows up right on His own time. Not in His time. It, is, it may be the third hour. It may be the at the very last moment. It may seem like to us before the enemy drags us under and before we go down in defeat. But God will certainly come in the midst of your mess. He will come to you in your midnight hour. And suddenly, verse 26, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately... All the doors were open and every one's bands were loose. What does it say? It says that all of the doors were open. And does it say just Paul and Silas bands or chains fell off? No. All the doors were open and every one's bands or chains were loose. Praise the Lord. Not only are the chains of bondage broken in your own life when you when you pray and when you praise and worship the Lord. Not only are the chains of bondage in your life broken, but you, by your prayer and by your praise, you will cause the bondage to be broken off of other people's lives. Think about it. As you praise God, people around you are going to be affected by your praise. As you praise the Lord, people around you are going to be set free because of your praise. Think about it. Others around you reap the benefit from your praise. Hallelujah! Glory to God! And I'll never forget when I first started going to a full gospel church and I, the first time I was around praise and worship, I was quiet. Baptist, we didn't do that in the Baptist church. We sung the hymnals. Things <laughs> 222. We sung the hymnals. We didn't, we didn't praise and worship in total abandonment. We didn't do like King David, jump out and then just dance in the Holy Ghost. We didn't do any of that in, in the Baptist church. And I'll never forget when I came into the full gospel circle, when I began to go to those worship services, and when I began to look around and I saw people with uplifted hands and uplifted faces and their eyes were closed, and they were singing and worshiping the Lord and praising the beauty of His eyes. There was such a peace. There was such a joy. There was such a love. 
that inability to, to, to be vocal and to say anything out in public. All of that, those chains fell off of me. Why? Because I was in the midst of a people Praise that was praising and worshiping yes. the Lord. And their praise affected me. Their praise caused the chains of bondage yes. that off me to, to fall off and to be broken. And I was free to jump right in there and to begin to lift my hands and praise and worship my God in total abandonment. Yes. Their praise affected me. And when yes. you are going through a fiery trial, when you are in the midnight hours and the chains of bondage that the enemy has brought in your life, when you pray and when you praise, woo, the chains of bondage, God will send you suddenly in your life. God will send you suddenly in your midnight hours. He will come out suddenly on the scene. When it doesn't look like there's any hope, when it doesn't look like there's any way out, are you facing some problems that it doesn't look like there's an answer to? <laughs> Just pray <laughs> and begin to praise and worship the Lord. And the chains of bondage in your life will fall off. That your praise and your worship will cause the chains to fall and it will cause you to be set free. Hallelujah. What are y'all sitting there? 
just had a shout out talking about everybody being affected by your praise. Hallelujah. Everyone around you can be set free if you won't be inhibited and if you will just cut loose and just let go and let God and just yield yourself unto God and praise Him and worship Him with your whole heart in total abandonment unto Him. Now what happened in the rest of this story? Look at verse 27. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled but Paul cried with a loud voice saying do thyself no harm for we are all here then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said sirs what must I do to be saved and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. So not only was the Philippian jailer born again and got baptized, but all of his house, every family member he had, they heard the word of the Lord on salvation. They believed and they received salvation and they were all baptized. Verse 34. And when he had brought them into his house, he said, Meet before them and rejoice. Don't you know they were rejoicing? These Gentiles, that's the first time that they had heard the word of salvation. Don't you know they were rejoicing and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Think about it. As a result of Paul and Silas praising and worshiping the Lord, not only was the Philippian jailer saved, but all of his family members were saved also because the Bible promises that salvation is for you and for your whole house. You remember I did an entire teaching on this. I have an entire series on salvation is for you and for your whole house. We went through the scriptures and we saw it over and over in the Word of God. It's from cover to cover. Salvation is for you and for your whole house. We started in Genesis and we saw how salvation was for Noah and for his whole house. And we worked our way all through the Bible seeing one instance after another of salvation being for a whole household. Rahab the harlot and her whole house when the walls of Jericho fell down flat everybody was destroyed except Rahab and her whole house her and her whole family was saved because she hid the spies we went from cover to cover seeing that salvation is a household thing that God does and if he did it in the Bible he's still doing it today because he's the same yesterday today and forevermore he does not change Change. And that word salvation doesn't just mean getting saved and going to heaven when you die. Salvation means five things. Do you remember? The Greek word for salvation is sozo. S-O-Z-O. -O. Sozo is the Greek word for salvation. And it means healing. It means salvation. It means preservation it means deliverance and it means a sound mind salvation every time you read the word salvation every time you read the word saved you can think of those five things that that word sozo means healing not only if when you, you get born again, not only is, is salvation and eternal life for you, but healing is for you also because Jesus took stripes upon His back. And the Scripture says, With His stripes ye are healed. Hallelujah. Healing, healing, salvation, preservation, deliverance, 
and a sound mind. You get all of that when you get so so. You get all of that when you get saved. So I am sure that all of you have prayed for your lost family members. Frida, I'm sure you've, you've prayed for your kids. And I know Bill and Belinda has prayed for their kids. I know all of you have got lost family members, and I do too. But, but we know from the Word of God that salvation is for us and for our whole house. So we can begin to praise the Lord and thank Him that salvation is for our whole household. And we can see from this passage of Acts chapter 16 that when we praise, when we worship the Lord, not only will you be set free from the areas that the enemy has held you captive, but those around you will be set free also. They'll be affected by your praise. I told you about when I first received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, began to go to to spirit-filled churches, I looked around and I saw their joy. I looked around and I saw the smile on their face and I saw the happiness and I said, God, I don't know what they've got, but I want what they've got. I saw them lifting their hands in praise and worship unto the Lord. I saw them shouting. I saw them dancing. I saw them praising the Lord and I said, God, I want what they've got. I was affected by their praise. And if we will just praise and worship the Lord just in total abandonment unto Him like King David did, not only will the chains on our feet that the enemy has held us bondage and held us in captive all of our lives, not only will we be set free, but everybody around us is going to be affected by our praise. praise God. Hallelujah! The seventh reason that we want to talk about the reason that you should praise and worship the Lord is that when you praise and worship, then this will cause the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Praise and worship will cause the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Turn to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 3. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 10. Praise and worship will cause the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. In this passage, we see that there were three kings and their armies that had joined themselves together as one to fight a battle against their enemies. There was the king of Judah. He was King Jehoshaphat. He was a good king, a godly king. Then there was the king of Israel. Even though they were all part of the 12 tribes of Israel, remember they would fight against each other. Remember the kingdom divided. And the, the tribes split between the 10 tribes to the north, the 2 tribes to the south. So they would fight against each other oftentimes. So there was the king of Judah, King Jehoshaphat, a good the king. There was the king of Israel, and then the king of Edom. These three kings joined themselves to fight a battle against their enemies. King Jehoshaphat, he was the godly king, and he asked in verse 11, but King Jehoshaphat said, is there, there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the kings of Israel's servants, answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. So the servant said, Hey, there is one prophet. There is one prophet of God in the land. Verse 12. So these three kings, they went down to see the prophet Elisha. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and go to the prophets of thy mother. And why? Because you remember the, king, the northern kingdom of Israel had gotten into idol worship and they were seeking guidance from their idol gods. And, and Elisha said, Why didn't you go and inquire of the, your idol gods if you needed a word uh, from the Lord? 
And so uh, Elisha was not happy with the king of, of Israel. And in verse 14, Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. Elisha said, Hey, if it wasn't for this godly king that is standing before me, I wouldn't give you other two kings the time of day. I would not I'd leave a look in your direction. But... He's a godly man. And he is coming and he is inquiring of the Lord. He needs a word from the Lord. So, verse 15, Elisha said, But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord. Now what happened? The prophet Elisha, he needed to hear a word from the Lord, didn't he? But he wasn't hearing anything. And don't we go through times like that? Aren't there times in your life when you need to hear a word from the Lord about a certain situation, about a certain decision that you need to make? But it seems like the Lord's voice is silent. It seems like that you're not hearing anything. I don't know about you, but sometimes it seems like I've got spiritual earwax. And I'm hard of hearing the word and the direction of the Lord. Well, in this passage, the three entire armies could be wiped out in this battle. So Elisha really needed to hear a word from God in order to give these three kings and their armies direction and tell them what to do. But Elisha wasn't hearing a word. So what, what did he say? Bring me a minstrel. In other words, bring me a musician. Bring me a psalmist. Bring me somebody that can play a musical instrument. And when that musician began to play that worship music, the anointing of the Lord came upon Elisha. And the Lord spoke through the prophet Elisha and he gave specific instructions as to what they was to do in this battle that they were facing. And God worked a miracle and gave them the victory. I wish we had time to read this entire passage. You can read it when you get home. How God worked miraculously in their behalf. But Elisha wouldn't have heard that word. He wouldn't have got that word from the Lord if he hadn't have said, bring me a minstrel. Because Elisha was in the flesh, wasn't he? Because he said to those other two kings, hey, I, I wouldn't even look your direction. I wouldn't give you the time of day if it wasn't for this godly king, if it wasn't for King Jehoshaphat. So Elisha was walking in the flesh. Aren't there times when we are in the flesh too? But he really needed a word from God. And so he said, bring me a minstrel. And as that musician began to play, the anointing of the Lord came upon the prophet Elisha. It is through the office of the psalmist and minstrel or the musicians that the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes upon the minister. So many times in a church service, before I've been uh, supposed to get up and teach the Word, I'll be sitting there and I don't feel a thing. I feel about as spiritual as a doorknob. But I'll hear the music or I'll hear that anointed praise and the anointing of the Lord comes upon me. Why? Because the praise and the worship ushered in the anointing of the Lord. And you will find that that is true. Praise and worship will cause the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon the minister. But it not only comes upon the minister that stands in the pulpit, you're a minister. Everybody is a minister under the Lord. And when you praise and worship, even in your own home, driving down the road in your car, when you've got your praise and worship music on and you're just loving on the Lord, the anointing will come upon you through praise and worship. And it comes in your own personal life. Anointed worship will cause you to be more sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit when you need wisdom, when you need guidance, when you need direction, when you need the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life. Not only for your needs, but you need the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon you in order to help others. I don't know. I'm sure you encounter people that need a word from the Lord, that need wisdom. They ask you questions that there's no way in the natural that you know 
what to tell them. But the anointing of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And that you will just you'll just remember scriptures that you hadn't thought of in years. Have you not ever experienced that? Have, have you ever talked to somebody and tried to witness to them about the Lord or share something with them that encouraged them? And, and it seemed like you, you just stumbled over your own words. It seemed like it was hard. It seemed like it just wouldn't come out right. It seemed like what you were saying was not effective. It was like pulling teeth. And then at other times, when you've been, been talking to somebody, when you've been witnessing, when you've been sharing about the Lord with them, at other times it's so easy. And those scriptures will just pop into your mind just like bullets. And you'll be quoting words. You'll be quoting scriptures. And you didn't even know that you remembered. What is the difference? It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that comes upon you and the, you will find the more that you praise, the more that you worship the Lord, the more quickly the anointing of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and when you need it. Either when you need wisdom and guidance and direction for your own life or when, you, when God brings somebody across your path to witness to, to minister to, to just to give a word of encouragement. You will find that if you spent time praising and worshiping and loving on the Lord, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will come upon you so much e more easily and more quickly if you have spent time praising and worshiping the Lord. So that is one of the main reasons that we need to praise and worship Him is that because the anointing of the Holy Spirit will come upon you when you spend that time praising Him, worshiping Him, getting in His presence, just loving on Him. Hallelujah! Yeah. Woo. Woo. Number eight. Reason number eight. That we should spend time praising and worshiping the Lord is that praise and worship ushers in the glory of the Lord. This is just one of the many, many reasons that we should praise and worship the Lord. So turn to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 5. 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Oh, we're just touching on just a few of the reasons why you should praise and worship the Lord. There's as many reasons why you should praise and worship the Lord as there are scriptures in this holy written word talk that talk about praise and worship. Every time that you read a passage where you see the people of God praising and worshiping Him, that is a reason why you should praise and worship the Lord. And I've just picked out just eight of the numerous reasons why we should praise and worship the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 5. Praise and worship ushers in the glory of the Lord. In this passage, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, King Solomon had built a beautiful temple for the Lord. And they were going to dedicate this temple under the Lord. Verse 4. And all the elders of Israel came and the Levites, or the, the, the Levites were the priests. So the elders of Israel came and the Levites, or the priests. The Levites took up the ark and they brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priests and the Levites bring up. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark sacrificed sheep and oxen which could not be told nor numbered for multitude. Think about so many animals being sacrificed upon the altar that day. So many of them were sacrificed that they couldn't even count them. They couldn't even number them because there were so many of them. Verse 7, And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place. Notice that. His place. To the oracle of the house. That word oracle in the Hebrew means the innermost part of the sanctuary. They brought the ark of the covenant unto the Lord, of the Lord unto his 
place, under the Lord's place, to the oracle of the house. Think about it. The innermost part of the sanctuary into quite the most holy place. That word holy in the Hebrew is sacred. They brought the Ark of the Covenant into His place, the Lord's place, to the innermost part of the sanctuary, to the most sacred place, the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. And what did the Ark of the Covenant represent in the Old Testament? It was where the very presence of God dwelt. Now look at verse 12. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them Asaph of Heman and Jeduthun. These were the praise and worship leaders, Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman. They were the main, they were the three main worship leaders. So all the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harp, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. Now look at verse 13. It came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in what? Praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. That then, everybody say then, then, the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand the minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. As the singers, as the musicians were as one, as they were all in unity, lifting up their voice as one voice. What were they doing? Praising and thanking the Lord. Then... The whole house was filled with the cloud. The cloud of the Shekinah glory of God Himself. God Himself came down in their midst. And the glory of God filled the house. And the priest couldn't even stand up to minister in the house of God because the glory of the Lord had filled the entire house. Now, and you think, well, that's great, that's, but that's Old Testament. But think about it. We don't have a literal temple today, but God dwells in us. Our body is the temple of the house of the Lord, of the dwelling place of the Lord. We don't have a literal temple today where the presence of God dwells, but you and I are the temple of the Lord. I want you to turn to the New Testament, to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Did you realize that when Jesus was on the cross and when He bowed His head and when He died, when He said it is finished and when He gave up the ghost, when He died, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. God tore that veil. God tore that, that curtain that separated Him from the rest of the people. God Himself tore that veil from the top to the bottom. I have read where that veil, that curtain was three feet thick that two teams of horses could not pull, could not tear that veil. But when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was torn. It was rent from the top all the way to the bottom. From God all the way down to man. And God's glory moved out of the Holy of Holies, moved out of that earthly temple. And God's glory now lives in 
this temple, in that temple, in our bodies. And we house the very glory of the Most High God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he says, What? Know ye not or don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. You don't belong to yourself anymore. Once you get sozo, once you get saved, once you get born again, you're not your own. You don't belong to you anymore. You belong to Him. You, verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And God's glory, His presence moved out of that earthly holy of holies. And God's presence now lives, now dwells, now resides within us. The Shekinah glory of God that filled the house of, of the Lord, that filled Solomon's temple, that same glory resides within your spirit, man. Hallelujah! As you praise and as you worship the Lord, His glory just begins to rise up from your spirit man and just fill your entire temple, your entire body. And that happens just like we read in the passage in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Just as they praised and worshiped the Lord, the glory of God filled the house of God. And the more you praise, the more you worship, the more He manifests His presence to you because God cannot resist your praise. <laughs> Woo! And the more He manifests Himself to, to you, the more He fills your temple or your body with His glory and with His presence. Praise God! Isn't that glorious? Yeah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Now turn back. I, I should have told you to hold your place there in Second Chronicles. I want you to look at it again. Second Chronicles chapter 5. You house this same glory. The glory that filled this Old Testament temple. Second Chronicles chapter 5. Look at verse 13 again. It came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand the minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. God. As the singers and musicians were as one, as they were all in unity, in one mind and in one accord, praise, well, they were doing two things, praising and thanking. That word praising, if you look it up in the Hebrew, is halal, H-A-L-A-L, H-A-L-A-L, halal. You know what it means? It means to shine. It means to make a show. It means to be clamorously foolish. That's what King David was doing that day when he was leaping and dancing with, before the Lord with all of his might. He was being clamorously foolish. He was praising the Lord with every fiber of his being. And that's what these people here in this passage were doing. They were all making one voice. They were all praising and worshiping the Lord as one. Praising and thanking. That word thanking in the Hebrew is yada. Y-A-D-A-H. And it means to worship with extended hands. So they would have their hands raised. They were lifting up their hands and they was praising the Lord and singing and worshiping Him with all of their might. They were being clamorously foolish. And as they worshiped their God in total abandonment and as they lifted up their voice in unity all in one mind and in one accord, as they made one voice in going up in praise and worship 
to the Lord. The Shekinah glory of the Lord filled the house and the priest couldn't stand up to minister because of the glory of the Lord that had filled the house of God. And as you praise and worship the Lord in unity, we can have that here. Yes. Think about Amen. it. If we would all get in one mind and in one accord and praise Him in unity and praise Him at all as one voice, worship Him in total abandonment, everybody joining in, worshiping with their whole heart. God cannot resist that kind of praise. He shows up and His presence fills the whole house. The glory cloud fills the entire sanctuary. When our praises go up to Him, His presence comes down to us. God inhabits the praises of His people. Write this scripture down. Psalms chapter 22 verse 3 says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. That word praises, Psalms 22, 3, Thou art holy that inhabitest the praises of Israel. That word praises in the Hebrew is tehila. I like tehila praise. T-E-H-I-L-L-A-H. It means a hymn. It means to sing a hymn of spontaneous praise. When everybody is just praising and loving on Him. God, we did last last week. We shouted. We sang. We praised Him last week. And I have, can, I have, can tell you for a fact, I have been in services over the years when I have seen with my natural eyes, I have seen the glory cloud roll in. I have seen the entire room of the sanctuary become cloudy like a mist or like a fog. The anointing would be so strong in that service and the anointing of the Holy Spirit would come upon people that would begin to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. People would begin to prophesy. People would begin to get healed. Miracles would take place. I remember in, in one service years ago, I had my eyes closed and I, we were having a time of Tehillah praise. Just everybody lifting up their voice and praising and worship under the Lord. And I opened my eyes. I, I was just loving Him and worshiping Him with my whole heart and I opened my eyes and I saw drops of light coming down through the ceiling and there were, those drops of light were falling just like rain in the natural and those drops of light would come down through the ceiling and when they would get just a couple of feet above people's heads they would disappear it was the light of the glory of God that was falling like rain in that service. And you talk about an anointed service. I tell you, it was awesome. But God let me see the light. His glory falling down like rain in that congregation, in that service. I've been in huge meetings over the years with thousands and thousands of people. I've been in Kenneth Hagin camp meetings. I've been in meetings with Benny Hinn and others. I've been in these huge, huge arenas and stadiums where thousands and thousands of people would be praising and worshiping the Lord and the anointing of the Holy Spirit would just move in and the glory cloud would fall and I've seen people healed. I've seen people get out of wheelchairs one night in a Kenneth Hagin camp meeting they lined people up across the stage with, that were in wheelchairs and he went down one by one laying hands on them and I saw them one after the other get up out of those wheelchairs. I have seen blind eyes open. I have been seen the deaf hear. I have seen the dumb speak. I have seen the crippled walk. I have seen some awesome things in these huge services as everybody would praise and worship the Lord as one voice as they would be loving the Lord and worshiping Him. The anointing of the Lord, the glory of the Lord would move into that service. And I tell you, I have experienced the presence of the Lord to that degree that when I walked out of that service, I knew I was forever changed. I'll never be the same. I tell you, if you see somebody in a wheelchair get up and walk, you don't, you don't sleep for days. If you see blind eyes open, it, it makes a lot 
lasting impression of, on you. You'll never be the same once you have experienced that, once you've been in that kind of anointing and in that kind of the glory of God. And God will do it for us here. Why? He's no respect for a person. God will do it for us here in this house. If, if, if we can get to the place in our praise and worship where we lifted up our voice as one, just as these people did in, the, in this day in the Old Testament when they were dedicating the, the temple. If we would get to that place where we would lift up our voice as one, total abandonment, all in unity, and begin to praise and worship Him and be clamorously foolish, just worshiping with all of our heart and love Him and just get lost in praising and worshiping Him, then His anointing and His glory would come and fill this house just as it did that house that we read about in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. And I say, grant it unto us, Lord Jesus, that that is yes. the cry of my heart. Amen. 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 Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Yes. If God did it for them, He'll do it for us too. He's no respecter of persons. I could spend the next two years teaching on praise and worship and not even get started good. Not even scratch the surface. There is that much in the Word of God on praise and worship. I tell you, I could take you to depths that, that you've not even thought about. It, but this is just praise 101. This is just an introduction to praise and worship. I could teach you for weeks and months on the seven Hebrew words for praise. Are you interested? Yeah. Let me just, you can just jot them down. And when, when I teach on this again, we'll, we'll cover more in depth. This has just been the introduction to praise and worship these last few weeks. Just getting your feet wet because this is so new to so many of you. But praise and worship should be a way of life. There are seven Hebrew words for praise. Number one is halal. We talked about it just briefly tonight. It's number 1984 in the Strong's Concordance. It's H-A-L-A-L. -L -L. It means to make a show. It means to glory in. To be clamorously foolish. Number 1984. We get our word hallelujah from this Hebrew word halal, H-A-L-A-L. -L. We get our word hallelujah, which means praise to Yahweh. This, this Hebrew word is found over and over and over and over and over in the word of God. The second Hebrew word for praise is yada. It's number 3034, yada. Y-A-D-A. H. We touched on it briefly. It means to worship with extended hands. Giving oneself in worship and adoration unto the Lord. The third Hebrew word is Barak. B-A-R-A-K. Barak. It's number 1288. Barak. It means to kneel or to bow. It means to give reverence to God as an act of adoration. Barak, to kneel, to bow, to give reverence to God as an act of adoration. I like that, don't you? So kneeling, bowing before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. The next Hebrew word is Tehila. It's number 8416. 8416. Tehillah. T E H I L L A H. It means to sing halal or to sing a hymn of spontaneous praise. It's just glorifying the Lord just with your whole heart, with your whole being, worshiping the Lord. Tehillah praise. 
Zamar is the next Hebrew word. Z-A-M-A-R. Zamar. It's number 2167. 2167. It means to pluck the strings of an instrument. To praise the Lord with song and musical instruments. Two left. The next Hebrew word is toda. T O D A H. It's number eighty four twenty six. It means to give worship by the extension of the hand in adoration. To worship with the extension of the hand in adoration. Just magnifying, praising, worshiping the Lord God. The last Hebrew word for praise is Shabbat. S-H-A-B-A-C-H. Number 7623. It means a loud adoration or a shout. Proclaiming with a loud voice. When you shabak, when you shout with a loud voice, you are offering up a shabak praise unto the Lord. Oh, I could spend weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks just on those two, those seven Hebrew words, just on covering scriptures where each of these words are mentioned. It is awesome. And we talked about how they dedicated the temple of Solomon. And I could compare the tabernacle of Moses with the tabernacle of David. And how in the tabernacle of David, it was located on Mount Zion, there were singers in singing in the tabernacle of David, there was none in the tabernacle of Moses. There was only the animal sacrifices. There was instruments and music in the tabernacle of David, but not in the tabernacle of Moses. The Levites ministered before the ark in the tabernacle of David, but the high priest only in the tabernacle of Moses could enter in into the Holy of Holies once a year, and that was not without the blood. There was recording or writing down everything that went on in the tabernacle of David. There was none of that in the tabernacle of Moses. There was thanking the Lord. There were, they appointed ministers, not just to, to come and praise the Lord, but they appointed ministers to do nothing but thank God. Think about it. In the tabernacle of David. There was none of that in the tabernacle of Moses. There was singing songs. There was praise. There was rejoicing and joy. There was clapping the, the hands. There was shouting. There was dancing in the tabernacle of David. There was none in the tabernacle of Moses. Only the animal sacrifice. There was lifting up of hands. There was worship. There was bowing before the Lord. There was seeking the Lord. There were, there were spiritual sacrifices. And they were in the tabernacle of David. But there were only animal sacrifices in the tabernacle of Moses. There were people saying amen and blessing in the tabernacle of David. But not in the tabernacle of Moses. There were singers, there were musicians appointed by David and Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman. They were the main worship leaders in the tabernacle of David. They, the musicians and the praisers, they had to serve an apprentice, apprenticeship of five years before they were qualified to go in and worship and praise the Lord. They assigned them in ranks. There was a whole rank. There was a whole group of people. There were 24 courses of praisers and worshipers in the tabernacle of David. One course went in every hour. Every hour, a new bunch of people came in to praise and worship the Lord. There was worship going on in the tabernacle of David 24 hours a day because every hour they changed and a, a fresh crowd came in to do nothing but praise and worship the Lord. And the only thing going on in the tabernacle of Moses was animal sacrifices. Oh, there are depths and there are levels in the Word of God of praise and worship that you hadn't even thought of. And we can go there. And I don't know about you, but I want to go. I want all God has for me. I want to experience the Shekinah glory of God coming upon this house. Do you? Yeah. But it will take us doing our 
Paul. It will take us doing our part of praising and thanking Him. How? In one of mind, in one accord, lifting up our voice in unity as one, just as they did in the Old Testament. That's what we will take for us, worshiping in total abandonment. Have you enjoyed this series on praise? Yes. yes. I'm only going to do two more weeks. I'm going to shift here, and I'm going to cover the how-to, the different ways that you can praise and worship the Lord, like singing, shouting, lifting our hands, bowing, kneeling, and praising Him with musical instruments, and just worshiping Him. All of the different ways in the Scripture that we can praise and worship the Lord. And that'll be the next two weeks. The second week, I'm going to devote the entire teaching to dancing before the Lord. There's things about dancing before the Lord that you don't even have a clue. You've never even heard about. But we're going to cover the six Hebrew words for dancing before the Lord. There's six words in the Hebrew and two words in the Greek for dancing before the Lord. You didn't know about dancing men in the New Testament, did you? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And we're going to, go, we're going to spend two weeks and then we'll... Be, like I said, that will be praise 101 when, when we've just covered the basics. This is the introduction to praise and worship. And look how many weeks we've been doing it. Hey, I tell you, it's, it's sparked a new hunger and a desire within me. I praised and worshiped the Lord before, but I tell you, during this series,